This week, we welcome back Shawnee Dodge and Roy Cohen from Vicarious to apply what we've learned in previous segments and actually prioritize our vulnerabilities and remediation the right way. Paul Batista, CEO and co-founder of Polarity, joins us for the following segment and shows us how to use and customize augmented reality to speed up security analysis. In the security news, Kashmir Black Botnet is behind attacks on CMSs such as WordPress, Joomla, and Drupal. Cyber criminals are coming after your coffee. Irrigation systems and door openers are vulnerable to attacks. If you have Oracle Web Logic exposed to the internet, you are likely already pwned. Who needs Internet Explorer any longer? And why isn't MFA more popular? All that and more on this episode of Paul's Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly. For security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails flow steady. It's Paul's Security Weekly. Want to be more thorough while also working faster? It doesn't matter if you're on the red or blue team, an augmented reality overlay can enable you to be more thorough and faster at the same time. No glasses, no goggles, Polarity delivers this superpower as an overlay on top of your existing workflow and tools. The free community edition connects to the data you care about to overlay the context you need to make informed decisions. Apply for early access today at securityweekly.com forward slash Polarity. FlexTrack is the platform that helps cybersecurity practitioners get the daily work done. Red teams can create reports in half the time and track risk to resolution with the blue team. Teams can centralize remediation efforts across all scans, assessments, and audits. Effectively communicate risk in real time through simple visualizations, scanner and ticketing integrations, and robust analytics. FlexTrack is perfect for collaboration across all teams. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash FlexTrack to claim your free month. The average large enterprise has 24 million vulnerabilities. The good news is only 5% will probably be exploited. But which 5%? That's where Kenna comes in. Kenna Security's modern vulnerability management technology combines real-time threat intelligence, data science, and automated risk analysis to prioritize the vulnerabilities that pose the biggest threat to your organization. Team up with Kenna Security and make the most of your limited resources. Learn more at securityweekly.com forward slash Kenna Security. His groundbreaking paper, Bizarre Mating Rituals of Even-Toed Crepuscular Ungulates, is considered required reading around the world. And his groundbreaking novel, Sir Isaac Newton, Who, uh, is just, you know, wow, I can't say how much. Mr. Paul Asadorian. Welcome, everyone, to Paul's Security Weekly. It's episode number 672, recorded on October 29th, 2020, right here in G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island. To my left is none other than Dr. Doug. Welcome, Dr. Doug. They let me in here again. <laughs> they did. You're back. It's I'm awesome. back. On the lines remotely, Mr. Jeff Mann is here with us. Jeff, welcome. Hi, Jeff. He said hi, Paul, for those uh, who are... Sorry. Maybe. There you go. I was He's... muting so I could say disparaging things about you. I'm sorry. That's okay. You don't have or, to mute. Uh, when have two. you ever muted to do that, Jeff? Come on now. <laughs> my, my bad. Mr. Tyler Robinson is on the lines remotely. Welcome, Tyler. Thank you. Very uncharacteristic of uh, Mr. Jeff. So hopefully someone had gave that guy a drink. Tyler, uh, you are uh, changed jobs uh, recently. I don't know how much more I want to say about that in case I wasn't supposed to say anything yet. No, great but... timing. <laughs> so uh, tell yeah, us definitely. in the audience. Hopped over to uh, Trimark Security with uh, Sean Metcalf, uh, doing some cool things over there. Uh, if you guys don't check out adsecurity.org, it is the de facto guide for anything Active Directory. And spun up my own company doing some uh, offensive kind of boutique work for people. So, <laughs> yep, very interesting things. People, not aliens, although that's not completely off the table. Yeah, no, come on. Open open to contracts. They're and an it, equal opportunity, uh, offensive right? security source. And if you weren't my already my go-to AD person, you certainly are now. <laughs> so, outstanding. <laughs> Lee Neely is here with us. Lee, welcome. And it's good to be here from the other side of the state. Tyler's on one end, I'm on the other. We keep this place balanced and uh, looking forward to a fun show. And 
Yeah, it's still not quite used to the sun still being up at this hour. It's getting darker earlier. It certainly is. Uh, quick announcement before we get started. Security Weekly, in partnership with the Cyber Risk Alliance, is excited to present Security Weekly Unlocked on December 10th. 2020, the inaugural edition of Security Weekly Unlocked also celebrates Security Weekly's 15-year anniversary. And after 15 years, I still can't pronounce inaugural. I was going to say, I'm not muted anymore. <laughs> Inna inaugural. inaugural. That, was, that was a new one. <laughs> I mean, give me some credit. That was a new one. Uh, it, the Native. Unlocked. Unlocked will feature talks from Ron and Cindy Gula, Kevin Finisterre, Vivek Ramachandran, and more. The agenda is live. You can go to securityweekly.com forward slash unlocked and register for this completely free event. Doug, you will be hosting a panel I am. on uh, diversity in cybersecurity. I, I am, yeah, apparently. So. It's awesome. Looking forward to it. The, the After Hours Paul Unleashed will uh, not be free. So That's right. Get your tickets from that. Tyler. <laughs> <laughs> this segment is sponsored by Vicarious. Please visit securityweekly.com forward slash Vicarious to learn more. Joining us today from Vicarious is, of course, co-founder Roy Cohen and Shani Dodge to discuss in more detail how we prioritize vulnerabilities. Roy and Shani, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for having us again. Uh, hi from the other side of the world. Keep things balanced. Yes, yes. And Shani and Roy, both, you have some really fun things planned for us again. I love when you both come on the show because we get to, like, play games and take quizzes and stuff. It's, it's, it's awesome. Yeah, we must keep the show on rolling. And uh, we got some special th things uh, prepared for you today. Um, but just a recap about uh, today's topic. Um, as we went... Um, just building up the series, uh, the first session was about uh, really how um, vulnerabilities are being disclosed and uh, how this process is being done by, you know, uh, offensive security researchers or, uh, you know, general public who finds vulnerabilities um, and what are advancements out there in this, uh, in this category. Then afterwards, we kind of discussed a bit about how vulnerabilities are being mitigated, you know, patches and the, the latest advancements of memory protection. Um, and for today's, we wanted to really go deep into, you know, prioritization, prioritization and how that could be uh, used for security teams to better understand what they should do in a more efficient way. Um, so I would let uh, Shani to uh, uh, basically hand over to, to begin. So over to you, Shani. Thank you, Roy. Um, so I was really looking forward for today to continue the discussion that we started two weeks ago. And I'll just um, remind you what we discussed earlier. Um, so there are far too many vulnerabilities um, in order for a security team to patch and protect the organization from all of them. And therefore, um, it have to have a method to prioritize with and you know, make a cut, everything that is above, let's say, eight to patch and protect the organization and what's beneath, unfortunately, it would never get to. And as we discussed in the previous session, uh, it really matters which method we choose because if we'll choose um, the less accurate uh, method, uh, we might be, um, we might, we might, uh, sorry, we might patch, you know, and protect our organization uh, from vulnerabilities that are less riskier in the way they are reflected in our organization. And on the other hand, we might miss out the vulnerabilities that are very risky for us and we will be exposed to the risk. And this is not a good method for us. And therefore, we ask ourselves, what are these methods that exist? And how can we do better? And we tried the calculator of the CVSS. We went and saw all the characteristics and we saw the base score that is provided by the NIST organization. And therefore it's really easy to use it and, and it's very common, but we have a lot of mistakes when using this method. And we saw that adding the full score meaning adding the temporal and environmental scores, though those characteristics that change and differ over time and environment uh, really make some change. And moreover, uh, we saw that prioritizing with context really matters. We had all those 
a few examples that we want to dig into today about how the context matters and makes a change. And now I want to ask you, uh, we really wish to prioritize with context. So which information can we collect to help us with this process? And I'm handing over the question to you and let me share my screen. Oh, so we have to fill this out, right? This, uh, yeah. Okay. Hold on. We're going to someone, someone fill time while I fill in my, someone talk, Doug. I should, <laughs> I should have done this before. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so what are your thoughts, Paul, when you're filling it out? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I can't. I'm, I suck it. He can't talk. I talk suck at multitasking. Time because, uh, it's my, yeah. it's my thought. <laughs> Just, so, but one word listen. answers, huh? We can listen to Paul type and, and, and <laughs> That's make, right. make some EDM music to go along with it. Like, <laughs> I mean, Mr. Jeff had an interesting kind of question with inside did. of Discord that is making me think a little bit more than I like. Yeah, tonight, but... uh, my, my work here is done. No, he was Go talking ahead, about Tyler. should the security team be doing the remediation or not, and change my mind. Right? Was yep. I I per, I personally think that it needs to be a, a group effort because the security team always wants to do as much as possible. The uh, the network admins and the uh, server admin people have to evaluate how much change is going to be occurring as a result of these uh, implementations. So you have to kind of streamline that with both groups, or you're going to have a big problem. Doug, I'm not sure how many of you uh, played for both teams, you know, the ones that toss the vulnerabilities and the ones which actually fix that. I can tell you from playing for both sides, it's kind yep. of hectic. It is. And I mean, I, I have done that where I've, I've sat there and I've had like both hats on and you kind of have to change. Yeah, but I've, I've been on both sides of that. And I know when the security people come to you and they say, we want you to implement all these changes and it's like, wait, 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 wait. We, we have to keep running the operation here. We can't just slap all these patches on today and hope for the best. And then I've been on the other side going, if you don't do this today, we're all screwed. So, you know. You also, ha you also have to have the, the business uh, or asset owners with the, inside the room as well because oftentimes IT and security are either the same or they're on the same side with the same kind of vision of how this has to happen. And that doesn't always align with the, the business risk and business goals uh, of an organization. So I think having the business people involved as well is important. And, and, and if, if, I mean, I would say that that's part of the risk, the risk analyst group too, that, that those are the people sitting there saying, do we need this? I mean, because I do think that that's something that gets assessed on that business side of like, how much impact will this have? How much is it going to cost? And do we really need to do it at all? And if we're just going to absorb that risk, and I and security people never like to hear that, but when you start talking about low impact, low likelihood uh, vulnerabilities, it may not be worth the risk to the enterprise if we put this in place, or it may be very inconvenient. So I, I, I'm on both sides of that issue, and I mean it depends on which hat I have on and how bad I don't want my whole operation to go down today. And, uh, you know, so I might want to put that off in a little while. That, I mean, that's why patching gets delayed, though, right? Because it gets pushed out into the future because we keep saying, oh, I want to do that today, but I really don't have time to bring everything back online if it crashes or reboot all these servers because this is like our big cycle. Which is another place I think that offensive security folks provide a lot of value in their attempt to demonstrate and or whether it's theoretical or not, um, highlight the availability of chaining together risks in order to cause impact because what IT sees or a vulnerability uh, has the potential to be uh, an offensive person can take and exponentially make that a, a much worse day like our, our evil hat is so evil that usually most people don't consider the things that we think about which is why they hire us so I and, think having that uh, diversity is what really makes you know, at the end of the day, and, it's, it's a dollars. And right? vulnerability, I mean, I, make money? I'm 100% with you on that. I mean, vulnerabilities can be multiplicative. So that one vulnerability by itself is not a big risk. But when you combine that with these other two, all of a sudden the risk goes from, you know, well, not so much to, or even three low vulnerability things that can all be chained together to create one really bad vulnerability thing are all... And I've seen that. I have seen people making recommendations going, yeah, but this isn't a big deal because they're never going to get into the network. And I go, yeah, but you have those other two that let them get into the network. And oh, that whole VPN thing you've got going is another huge risk. And when I put all three of the, and so yeah, I think having that offensive person there who thinks about that not just as this instance, but as this very holistic thing is really, really important. I, I, I absolutely agree with you. 
Um, if you have enough time, though, you know, eventually it's all a, a resource of, you know, of, uh, do you have enough time and enough uh, resources to, to prioritize? Because I think it's a good point you mentioned, Doug, that um, having the business also on, let's say, around the table to discuss about what our, ma- our remediation plan should, should be done. It's an interesting concept, but I wonder, you know, practical level, do you expect it to be what, like on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis? On a daily basis, how, how should it be to bring on the CFO, I don't know, the stakeholder for that specific system? Or how, how do you envision it? I, I mean, I think you have to track all those patches on a continual basis. It, it's not really a, just a monthly or daily or weekly. Somebody has to be looking at these threats on a, just, on a, on a nice continuous basis because otherwise threats are going to emerge and go, well, yeah, we'll get to that at the next monthly meeting and you've got a problem. So you have to bring those people together ad hoc when you need them. So to me, it's almost like a response team for like a, you know, like a fire or something. You'd be ready to go. So when something happens, you can assemble people, get information, evaluate it, make a decision pretty quick, and then decide how long it's going to take to put this in place. I know you can't always do that. I mean, before everybody comes after me with pitchforks and torches, but I mean, that, that ought to be sort of the, the optimal scenario. And it doesn't always kind of fall into that and everything's not always optimal. So, but you ought to be looking at this regularly, maybe a weekly meeting, if nothing else. I think, I think also having someone that has that high level picture from kind of all aspects, they, they integrate and work with the business units, the offensive team, the defensive team, uh, the risk management team, someone that has a a full kind of picture view uh, and is able to articulate whatever the risk is to each one of those units in their own, you know, verbiage. Those kind of people are the people you really want to kind of coordinate and have that full level, uh, high level view so that they can see the different chains and see the different aspects that may cause an issue between different business units. Yep. And, and I think you need to keep those people together on a regular basis because they need to know each other enough that they trust each other. Because when, when you get those people together and they don't even know each other, everybody's going to fight for their own castle. And so they're all going to sit there and the business people are saying, no, no, no. And the security people are saying, lock it down. And the IT people are saying, oh, God, we're all doomed. But if everybody knows each other enough to, to have some level of trust and communications on a regular basis, it really helps them to communicate, uh, you know, informally. It helps them to communicate by just making a phone call and saying, hey, what do you think about this? And then you can, you can, you can fight your fights in those meetings and try to, you know, and see who wins. Shawnee, did you did you want to go through the the tag cloud that we've been putting together uh, while this conversation is happening, which is asking um, how if we prioritize with context, what information would help us the most? Sure, sure. So I was just reading the answers, and it's very interesting because I think we can split them into um, actually four groups. The first group is all those um, characteristics that w- uh, we can find in the CVSS vectors, right? The full score that we were discussing in the previous session and the extra free new groups that we have here is the kind of context of the vulnerability. And uh, as we look at it, it's kind of the perspective. Um, what The first one is the perspective from the app point of view. The second is from the user point of view. And the third is from the asset. So let's discuss, right, what information we can um, collect from the app point of view. So we can uh, look at a vulnerability aggregation, how many vulnerabilities exist in this app, uh, which is the highest score of the vulnerabilities. We can look on uh, what process is running through this app, right? Is it protected? Does it use... uh, uh, address space layout randomization protection method. Does it maybe use buffer overflow protection? Maybe the relocation read only. So it's information we can add to this app to understand how it works. We can even look at the usage of this app, right? How often is it used? How many different uh, users use it? On how many different assets is it it's installed? We can even ask ourselves, is it running in the background or in the foreground? Um, This can give us a a much better understanding of this application, right? We can even look at the network, right? Does this app uh, use the network? Does it have open ports? Does it use exploitable ports, for example? Um, I like uh, also, is it a Gibson? Because that matters. Also, Tyler's near the network. I think that that matters. I don't know who put those in there. Uh, I guess uh, <laughs> some jokes, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, but other information about the application is, for example, the vendor, right? Who created this application, how popular it is. Is it, for example, Microsoft, Google, some other third parties that it's, you know, popular to exploit can give us some information about the vulnerability looking from this perspective. And, um, mm -hmm. and then we can move forward to the user's perspective, right? Um, what privileges is it running? I saw here admin usage, right? Which, wh who is the user that running this application? What privileges is it using? Is it maybe a domain admin? Maybe it's a part of the management team. All the, these are information that can help us um, to combine uh, with the vulnerability characteristics and 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 prioritize with context, right? And the third and last point of view is the asset point of view, right? Is it a desktop or a server? I saw some server running around on the screen, and um, is it running a database, an Active Directory? Um, what group is it included in? And, we can also ask ourselves, uh, what is the protection of the asset, right? Does it have an antivirus running? Is this antivirus up to date? Does it have methods like attack surface reduction enabled on it? Um, Shana, and of do, course we can. Sorry, sorry? Do, do many of these things kind of fall under that category of impact, right? I mean, really this is drilling down into what would be the impact of someone successfully exploiting this vulnerability and it's it's interesting because i think they do fall in that that category i'm curious to get your take on it and it really underscores for me, <clears throat> for me just how difficult it is to understand the impact of a vulnerability when all of these different factors and contexts play into the impact so i think it's a bit tricky because on the one hand some of them really fall into impact but on the other hand some of them are kind of ingredients that we want to see if there exists in order for the exploitation to happen, right? So I think it's uh, much um, and much more an extra layer of information than you know, kind of the impact of how it happens. Some of them can help us, uh, you know, to even uh, ask ourselves: Is this exploitation? Uh, is it likelihood that it would happen mm. in this vulnerability? Does it make sense? Yeah, and likelihood even has different aspects. The likelihood of a successful exploit versus the likelihood that an attacker may go after that as a target, right? So there's multiple aspects uh, to likelihood as well. Right, right. So, well, you know, taking summarized... all of these... Sorry, it's likelihood and likelihood that it'll be attempted and likelihood that it will be successful. Correct. Yeah. At least yes. that's, that's how we used to do it back in the day. Yes, thank you. That's <laughs> that's better than how I described it, for sure. No worries. Right, right. So now maybe Roy can show us a bit how can we combine all these um, contexts with the vulnerability characteristics and get you know a new model of prioritizing vulnerabilities. Yeah, so uh, thanks, Jenny. We kind of discussed, uh, as you recall, like some, some theories and some uh, how things could be combined in order to give us a better illustration of what, to what eventually we should do. Um, so we're going to do like another uh, quick uh, peek over the system. Uh, that's obviously is a dashboard where you can see to the left all of the different uh, the things the system collected, how many applications, how many assets uh, are covered, operating system, and so on and so forth. To the bottom left, you see uh, how many distinct CVEs. If you would multiply that with the amount of instances, obviously it's going to be far more. Uh, but how many distinct vulnerabilities we found? But eventually, uh, we combine the different things we kind of mentioned before in order to make uh, the right call on what uh, a given security professional should prioritize. Um, so some of the things are kind of uh, kind of uh, a given. We took the vector of the CV, uh, CVSS and basically disassembled it, and be, you know now it becomes visible, not just a, a random score, but actually something you can filter. Okay, I would like to see all the applications which are. Um, uh, don't, don't require any admin uh, uh, privileges, any all the vulnerabilities that don't require admin privileges, uh, I want maybe to focus on that first. Uh, and when you have all of that, let's call it the layout of the vulnerabilities and the, the, the scheme of uh, also uh, integrating external information, internal information, uh, this is something we, that we see which is very, very useful. For example, imagine you can take um, um, 
as we discussed about, again, in the former session, the, the base CVSS, one of them is um, there is an admin privilege required in order to successfully exploit. Just, it's maybe uh, a bit uh, odd, but if you require admin privileges, basically it's it's uh, harder to exploit, obviously, because there are some uh, requirements for, for the vulnerability. Uh, but if you combine that, so there is a requirement for uh, admin privileges and an application does run with a privileged user, Eventually, there is a match here. So again, there was a barrier for the attacker to to overcome. But on reality, on the target uh, uh, application, on a given instance at least, uh, we noticed it actually popped. It actually happened. Uh, and when you combine it with additional factors like does this computer internet facing, um, is there an exploit, and all of these parameters, eventually you get a very clear cut result of you know what are really the distinct things that. Uh, you should be focused on. So we got some like a subset of things that uh, that we support here. There are a lot more that are not uh, not shown here. Um, and the goal eventually is to you know tell the hey, Mr. Security guy these are the things you should be focused on, and that's that's why again not just a number, but things that he can coherently also go and deliver to the IT. We found it to be very effective when you go to the IT and tell them, look, there is a uh, you know, let's take a CVE 2020 something versus, look, we have an exploitable application uh, that can be abused through the external network. And it's actually happening in one of our one of our sites. Um, so maybe we should right. advance it first. Right. Are, are those tags automatically applied by yeah. Vicarious? Okay, so you're, you're deriving are. that context automatically so we don't have to go through the exercise as security professionals or, or IT administrators and, and manually like go through every single one and go, yeah, this one's internet facing and this one you know has an exploitable thing and this one runs with admin and this one doesn't, right? You're deriving that because you have an agent installed on these systems. Precisely. And we also try to take an attempt on the, the business uh, uh, criticality. Uh, as Doug mentioned before, it's, it's awesome to have everyone around the table and do it con on a continuous manner. As we know, you know, we are not living in a, still not in a, a utopia where everyone are sitting <laughs> around and, you know, tried really to solve the, the biggest issues for, for the company. Um, so we try to give, you know, to lend a hand for also for the IT or the security professional, then in came which of the, the uh, different assets or even applications were found to be uh, mission critical based, based on different algorithms we run. Um, so we try to like, you know, pinpoint what uh, also on the asset level or on the application level things that uh, are um, more risky for the company as, as a whole. And imagine big companies that every now and then, you know, you got maybe hundreds or thousands of machines being uh, uh, popped and shut down on, on a daily or weekly basis. It's very hard to keep track. Um, again, in the former session, we discussed about the full CVSS score. Doing it one by one and 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 ranking it, you know, what is the uh, um, what is the impact of a given vulnerability? Maybe on today, uh, you know, something can be listed as something which is not business critical, and tomorrow things change. You know, servers sometimes change their uh, designation; they change their role. Um, so the thing is, it's dynamic and it should be reevaluated all the time. So having something that can enrich information, you know, focusing on, on this thing is something that we found to be very effective with our um, with our clients. Um, so this is kind of the concept that we are popping all of these tags automatically. Um, and eventually you get a, like a list of things you should be focused at. So this is kind of the uh, overview of the system. And from here, you can drill down to and see the, uh, you know, go to an actionable screen where you're going to have all the different uh, applications that were listed. And of course, you can still have the, uh, the option to go and uh, see which of them, for example, got an exploit. You can also filter by a given uh, tag and uh, take an action. So um, this is how we try really to uh, focus the security professional of you know what he should do in the end of the day. Roy, how do you determine from within your software what the business impact might be? Because that's typically something that we say as a security professional, you should know the business, you should know what's most impactful. How are you deriving that in, in software? So there are some uh, assumptions you can, well, some assumptions you can do for uh, when you are examining uh, um, an environment or a network. Some, some you can have like a list of uh, services which you know to be risky 
For example, usually Active Directory or maybe um, uh, servers which are hosting uh, uh, SMTP services or database. These things, obviously, they could be for testing. It could be for uh, not necessarily production. Uh, but first, when you get it, this visibility, it's something that adds value for the uh, business context. And on the other hand, you can also do some measurement about the usage of the services. Uh, if you see a lot of traffic on a database application, um, maybe you examine, for example, port 3306, which is, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, it's the one associated with the MySQL. So you can uh, assume that something is uh, looks like or so behaves like a production server. Uh, you can do some analysis on the disk to try to track some um, sensitive information and to call it back to the application. So we do some tests. We like uh, sample some locations over the disk or the, the behavior or the, uh, you know, around the machine in order to determine if something could be in potential be uh, mission critical. Sweet. This seems like yeah. it saves a lot of time and a lot of debate right that's that seems to me what the the problem you're solving with this even one particular aspect of your product roy and shani is that debate that we had on the last show about how how impactful is it how likely is it how should we prioritize this right it takes a lot of that guessing work out and basically derives it for you precisely and that's the goal here eventually um, doing this process, uh, and I'm speaking of someone that was actually on that side, in both sides of, of this equation, uh, doing this process of ranking vulnerabilities is something that is very, very tough, very also stressful if you're doing, for example, as a pen tester. So probably you're going to pop some, some scanner, you're going to do some audit, and then some of the things that obviously are going to get to the report. And imagine it, again, coming, coming from the outside, sometimes it's not that easy to get the context of the company. And keep in mind that as a pet tester, you have a limited duration, which you need to eventually to find results, to craft a report and to hand it over. Um, so sometimes uh, sometimes the context is missing and it's something that could be in, in potential reflected in the report where you can pinpoint something that in potential could be critical. And then, you know, in the final meeting, the customer is going to tell you, look, it's not a production machine or whatsoever. Mm. Um so it's really something that is uh, that it could be helpful for that also for this specific process. And, and the answer doesn't necessarily have to be patch and risk the uh, the operational side of risk. The answer could be, as we spoke about in previous segments, Roy, that it's a uh, a virtual patch, right, that we discussed before. Yeah, precisely. Because there are some scenarios where, as like here, we see that there is a patch available and we can easily deploy that. But there are some scenarios, for example, we found some vulnerabilities in uh, OpenSSL that we did not in this uh, instance at least we didn't find any applicable patch so the uh, memory protection is something that could reduce the risk by uh integrating the memory protection like in runtime we'll mm -hmm. uh put the, the the trap so to speak in memory and just wait for an exploit to to happen hopefully either to just notify or to or to catch it uh, so obviously, a mitigation could be something which is, let's call it a traditional way, or something that is a bit more advanced uh, in that perspective. Um, also, I wanted just to add that obviously, um, the tags are also applicable for the asset. So imagine now you can filter all of the computers which are um, either, again, we see exploited to denial of service attacks or database applications or even got an exploit. And it's something that could be configured as a group. So imagine today you can say, you know what, my risk policies defines that everything which is exploitable with the confidence, you know, uh, uh, the exploit is, is a production. Okay, it's, it's uh, let's call it market ready. Um, so you can craft a group just for that and basically uh, build your policies and build your um, uh, remediation plan just according to that. And not necessarily, let's call it the traditional OU based or group based or network based. Because you know, reality it's more dynamic. Things things change. We some I had a client which uh, went through a list privilege uh, project where he told me there is no way we have admin rights on none of our computers, and we basically went here. And because again, we we track admin privileges for for correlation with the with the vulnerability, um, and we showed them very easily that we found some admin uh, computers who are running uh, with privileged users. Of course, we can pinpoint to the level of the actual application, and this in turn is uh, being translated to whether a vulnerability should, you should care of or not, whether there is this, this ingredients matched, so to speak. 
Roy, let's say you had a group of systems and their production systems that have very specific windows in which they could be patched. And I want the risk level to be derived from your awesome method of deriving the risk of a particular vulnerability. And I want to create a plan that says, look, for these group of systems, they have to be running during these these time windows. And the only downtime I might have is on weekends. And when a certain level of criticality or risk is found in any one of these systems, deploy the patchless uh, scenario, the patchless uh, technology to protect them in the meantime until such time the weekend comes, and then I want to go ahead and deploy the patches. Is that is that possible? So I don't want to steal Michael's thunder. There's going to be a session specifically for that, but basically this is definitely something that uh, uh, it's something that we are working on, but it will be achievable. Uh, we'll be showing it by the end of the year. So uh, stay tuned for that. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. Yeah. yeah, that's 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 really cool. I asked, um, I asked that very self-servingly <laughs> for, right, for our, our systems that run the shows that they can't go down most of the time during the week, right? Uh, it's, it's a big it's a big pain you know eventually um as an it you have you cannot will you know freely go and uh, just patch all over and uh, you know hopefully come the next uh, by the weekend come the next day walk uh, walking week and uh, hope that everything is gonna be alive and be up it's something that is very very challenging and obviously we uh, we need to adapt also on the security as a security vendor we need to adapt to, to a new reality and, and Roy, um, do we is, is there an aspect that chains vulnerabilities together in other words can it derive a risk level based on the fact that i've got this low risk vulnerability this medium risk vulnerability and those two together could lead to a high risk condition is that is that possible to achieve again not stealing michael's thunder uh, sorry yeah, i'm just you. spoiling it for the <laughs> for the next one but you thought yeah, you but, thought about that, and it's yeah. You, yeah. you have we're the going foundation through a to concept of yeah. uh, neurons. Neurons. Right. So imagine every X tag you see here, it's a neuron. When when you connect them together, you get an insight, which mm. is something greater than the, you know the sum of two. Because if you, as we just saw here, uh, as a simple example, we have admin uh, admin privileges, which I will be able to track sometime. And you have also we got here the admin usage, and we got also the admin privilege required. So we need to combine them. Again, there is a match. So yep. you have, um, again, a requirement for vulnerability to be uh, abused, and then it's being met on ground, you know, on the actual computer. So it's something that we may want to look on differently. Okay, there was a requirement and it was met. And so, I, I also, I love the high usage. I saw that in there. And I, I think that when we talk about browsers, that one's really interesting to me because we were going to talk about Internet Explorer in our news segment and I've had many conversations that kind of came down to what is the resiliency of the browser and when I look at when a, a browser has a vulnerability I think that it's a very high like if we look at Chrome most people are using Chrome likely using Chrome in my environment it's very high usage I think regardless of the what the CVSS score is and maybe even other factors, if it's high usage and it's got a vulnerability, yeah. that means it's got a pretty wide attack surface across my organization. So maybe I just want to go ahead and patch that, whether it's the virtual patch or the actual patch or some combination of, of scheduling between the two. That is a really awesome strategy, I think, to be able to thwart attacks uh, against your environment based on usage. That's really And awesome. that's, that scaling is really important, though, because if you've got... I mean, like I used to have a lab that was that was really low use. Mm -hmm. Like nobody knew it was there. Right. It, nobody could get to it, and it had a lot of vulnerabilities in it because that's what the guy wanted in that lab. Mm. You know, it, it just wasn't that big of a threat because it was, you know, it was it was nothing. But yeah, you start him at a Chrome vulnerability, even if it's a small one. The likelihood somebody's going to hit that is is really high. So mm -hmm. that scaling bubble's got to be in there. Uh, I would agree. I imagine um, again, these are you know real stories from from the ground, where um, this company of ours, one of our clients, that uh, before the COVID, so they obviously they handed over for, for their employees uh, laptops, and they all got uh, your favorite uh, uh, web conference uh, utility. So they had a variety mm -hmm. of these. Um, and when one of these web conferences utility got uh, got a critical vulnerability, they panicked and they didn't have at that time, um, you know, a modern uh, vulnerability remediation, vulnerability management uh, tool. Um, 
And more specifically, they didn't have any way to patch it. So basically what he did, he, he like sent an email, tell, told people to connect, to leave their computer connected to VPN over the night. And then he pushed uh, the patches over, over VPN. Um, when we later on uh, came along, we were able to show him that there are some quite like high percentage of, of the, uh, these web conference applications which are, were not even used. So um, yeah, it was installed. Yeah. It was there. There is a vulnerability. It's a fact. But the application, in, uh, at least when we once uh, we got deployed there, the, it was never never used. So the likelihood again is very low in that case. It's not it's not running. So maybe you should spend your time elsewhere. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we uh, as promised, we have uh, another uh, game of Kahoot prefetal, uh, also with. Yeah. Um, interesting questions not a poll this time uh so we we'll hand it over to shani i'm very excited to start the kahoot okay so i'll let you all um enter in and then we can start the game paul are you in the game yes i am somebody, you somebody can guess. repost the link it's way way up in the chat in the discord I am in there. I'm just being anonymous. Oh, really? Because <laughs> I'm not. Okay. I'm not Tyler. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what what does that even start, mean? So, <laughs> let's see how would you prioritize with context. So, uh, today security professionals do not have enough information to prioritize vulnerabilities with context. Is this true or false? It's an easy one on you. Starting off easy on us. <laughs> yeah, I was just wanting to, yeah, to give you a nice start. Softball to start us with. <laughs> well, one could say we have all of the information, but we don't use it. Yeah, though it's true or not true because it's very hard to collect and update all the information all the time. Mm -hmm. Who got that wrong? <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. <clears throat> the leader here yeah. I think at 960 points on one question <clears throat> I think it's who answers correctly first it's disproportionate uh, there's like a right. thousand points per any application right. so we have an application with a vulnerability that requires user interaction it is more likely to be exploited if it's running at the service it's barely used or it's running in the foreground it's so quiet when you when you, while you answer who told me that was quick <laughs> Yeah, the last time you complained, it was too quick. So we tried to extend it, you know, to give some time. Uh, and also, also now it's actual question. So, um, but Paul, this is also kind of uh, call it back to your question, how we measure. You ask about the business impact, but um, obviously um, you need to have some assumptions when you try to um, to um, to do the correlation between if you are breaking the vector, you know, the score of the vulnerability to different components, then obviously you need to to find a way to measure it. So, for example, uh, if an application, um, well, I will not spoil the answer. Um, I don't have this enough is information to answer the question. Sorry, <clears throat> I don't have enough security information to answer the question. Is, it, is that a stolen rate from your clients uh, looking to pass the PCI DSS certification? <laughs> <laughs> it's a trick question, Jeff. You were supposed to circle all the answers and write that in on the exam. Don't! <laughs> oh, interesting. That, uh, we get such, such a variety. But what I wanted to, to complete is that, uh, for example, in order to... Um, we got uh, one of the parameters of the of the of the base uh, CVSS score is that if um, user interaction is required. So one technique, obviously, to to try to find user interaction is that obviously if the application is shown in the foreground of the user. Not saying it's the only way, but this is a possible way to to achieve that. Mm. Yeah. Right. Oh, wow. Such a change. Right. 
Okay, let's continue. So an application with a vulnerability uh, with a vulnerability whose exploitation is based on port 8080 is most likely to be exploited on an asset that is connected to the internal network, an asset that is connected to the external network, or an asset with an open port over 443. These are much harder than the last time you folks were on. Yeah. yeah, I didn't know there was going to be a test. I would have drunk so much. <laughs> where, I would have drank a lot more scotch, but I'd known there was going to be a test. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a real quiz now. Yeah, we said... Gotta relax the system. brain. We should do it like one of those Japanese game shows where you get hit with something when you right. don't get the answer within so many seconds. It's a bucket of water or slime gets dumped on me when I... <laughs> big hammer falls swings the floor. Down. Have we got buckets of slime in the budget? Well, you're missing an option is that port 8080, if it's Tomcat, then it's the highest likelihood that it will be exploited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're going to make it too easy, Paul. <laughs> right? That would have been the obvious answer there. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, all these answers are kind of the ingredients we're sp we were talking about earlier and these X tags that Roe showed us in the, in the um, dashboard, right? So what you're saying is we should have paid attention to what you were saying yeah. earlier. We would have done Precisely. better on the test. Exactly. <laughs> I was arguing with Jeff on Discord. So. <laughs> That's why I failed calculus. Because you were arguing with Jeff on Discord? I was Discord. arguing with Jeff on Discord. <laughs> I actually right. got that one right. Nice. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, let's see, let's see what happens. I don't happens. get that last answer. Oh. Okay, let's mean, continue. This is a vulnerability that exposed the organization to attacks that enable database access should be mitigated first on all of the organization's assets, on assets that run a database, or on all of the servers. Lee, you can stay after class, and I'll, I'll we'll help you with the answers. <laughs> well, like I said, I was disagreeing on that last one because port eighty eighty shouldn't be externally reachable. You have to be on an internal system to reach it in the first place, or you've had to compromise a system that's on the inside to get it. So that's why I was kind of not sure about that. Yeah. You should have chosen D. You should None have, of the above. Yeah. Jeff, Jeff chose that on every one. The, the lead of course, try. I don't know the context. So like, I accidentally got one right. I was going for a perfect score of zero. Damn it. <laughs> this class is going to be curved, right? <laughs> yeah, it's created on the curve. <laughs> But it's a good point, Lee, that um, you know, missing context in many in vulnerability remediation is something that is uh, may. Mm -hmm. I, I think you have to have context agreement in that meeting we were talking about earlier. Right. I mean, because like, if the application li listening on port eighty eighty was written by me, your answer would be totally different. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you just need to add some answers on there for that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> written by Paul. Yeah, patch immediately. And by written by Paul, you mean copied from someone and something to do Stack o <laughs> Copy from Stack Overflow. <laughs> Downloaded from GitHub. And mm -hmm. Right, okay. So yet again, these are information that we can, you know, collect using our X tags. And let's see what happens. Paul, that's you, not Taylor? Yeah, moving up in the world. Yeah, that's amazing. I'm copying <laughs> off him, but I'm not doing so well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we have a puzzle for oh, you. Boy. Oh, God. Oh, boy. 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 How would you prioritize now? I would question why you have Firefox, Firefox installed on a production server and why you have SQLite installed on a production server. SQLite can be used in production. Come on now. Yeah, but... Uh, so, yeah, I, so you don't click now. You actually have to drag and drop mm -hmm. these things? Is that how it works? Yeah. <laughs> Is, That's part is of the test, one, Jeff. Is are, are we doing this English or uh, Hebrew style? It's left shapes. Right, right it's left. shapes and colors. <laughs> is it one to four left to right or one to four right to left? 
Oh my god! Mm. <laughs> I had you in That's class. I had somebody like oh. this in class once. So then, question. is it literal? He still hasn't so found the body. Air Fox Fox was on a single desktop because that's desktop that's a serious single. question. They're Israeli. They're used to doing things right to left. <laughs> but I think uh, Lee, but Lee's question is but Lee's question. Kahoot. Lee's, Kahoot Lee's, Lee's question is pretty funny on though. Yeah. In the uh, Firefox is installed on a yeah. desktop. That's a good one, Lee. That that probably means my answer was wrong, <laughs> which it was. Oh. So okay. what's the right order? Correct That's order is correct. it's right. Your production C server, full production, Firefox. So why do you prioritize a single installation of, Fire, of Firefox on one computer over a barely used app that is installed on the server for testing? Yeah, you, you, you've only got one Firefox installation in the whole org. Hopefully that test server doesn't have real creds or. There users you go. Yeah, that. There, there you go. Oh. <laughs> we can make a case regardless, Lee. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, last time they were on the show, Firefox was in the scope of the entire organization. Just remember, you're not looking for the right answer. You're looking for what they've interpreted to be the right answer. Yeah, I'm trying to guess what their answer would be, which is probably what i got to remember to do. <laughs> Jeff teaches Lee, overthinking Lee 101. He's not doing well on tests. <laughs> I, I am horrible Moving at multiple on. choice tests. I could argue. I, I can tell. <laughs> like, does that comma mean the whole answer is wrong and you're supposed to just tear the exam up and throw it in the trash? Yeah, exactly. There you go, Jeff. I've, I've had those students that are like that, and it's really tough for them to take tests because they're you know, obviously like, okay, look, just take a breath. I, nobody, it's not a trick question. Ask it's, me what I know. Uh, yeah, I know, but sometimes testing happens. Uh, I, have, I have, well, creating tests is an art form. It is, and I'm not good at it, but you have to suffer through it anyway. Yeah. I try to get Okay, practical. let's continue. Please. You tell him, Shawnee. Let's, let's move forward. Yeah, keep this thing in line. <laughs> Hey, Paul, you fell down. I did. Uh, if Joe beats me, he's Another gonna... puzzle, another puzzle. Oh, boy. Now you should get so it just oh. correct. Left to right. Left to right. We found four critical vulnerabilities. In which order should we mitigate them? The vulnerability that exists on an asset with an external network, the vulnerability that has a widely used exploit, the vulnerability that exists in an application that is highly used, or the vulnerability that exists in an application that is barely used. If, jo if Joe beats me, he has to take my seat for the rest of the show. <laughs> <laughs> so while you're thinking, Paul, so this is kind of, you know, connects to the question you had earlier. Mm -hmm. So we can, of course, take the vulnerability characteristics and add all this context about how is it used, mm -hmm. uh, who uses it, and you know, get a really new layer of information that helps us to prioritize. Right? Yeah, obviously, we try to yeah. simplify it, you know, the, the story here. Obviously, there's a lot more. Uh, there's also a string limitation for the question, so we need to cope with that. Um, but we try to make it, you know, simple in the sense of this is the world that we live in and uh, how we should remediate. If you put in a larger string, does it overflow a buffer? Yeah, maybe there's a format string, there, so you can never tell. <laughs> <laughs> it's protected. It's protected. Ah. Uh. <laughs> oh. Wah, wah. Joe's still ahead. Joe's going to be doing the rest of the show and I get to go smoke cigars. <laughs> Me too. <What? laughs> Joe's going right, crazy. Last with question. That. Last question. <laughs> Deploying a patch to which of the following applications would have the Can most I bet all my money? On yeah. their I bet all my points. <laughs> you can Just trade it for what's Jeopardy? behind Deploying door number three. Right, so I really like this question because this question... It kind of takes us into an aggregation, right? A perspective of the whole organization, all the apps in the organization, all the assets in the organization. So it's very, it's very interesting to look in a different perspective. Wait a minute. Is there one right answer? Yes. Or are we, yes. We're done. We're done I, with I the was, puzzle. I was trying to slide the boxes, and there's no way to do that.
What happened to Tyler? Did you drop out of the race? Did you forfeit? Yeah, he's, I he's always chain himself. all this, the the novel shit together to make it work. So my answers don't fit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My answer is physicals and scope. You'll, are doing this. you'll you'll still get a trophy. Don't you'll get a participation. That's badge. right. We're giving those out. Oh, Joe beat me. Really? He did. Let's see the podium. Uh-huh. Who is me? Who's that? Who's me? Yeah. Yeah. And Perkins. And winner. So. Joe. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, Not Paul. Be... You're the fourth. <laughs> Thanks for that, Shawnee. You Love get a that. land <laughs> trophy. <laughs> I want an essay test. Right? Oh, God. I want a math test. I like how fired up we all got about the test. Like, yeah, kill! Kill! Awesome. <laughs> Everyone went all competitive, you know, not disclosing any any uh, answers. Next time we're doing this, I'm going to keep pouring Paul more drinks before the test. So It might help me, like, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> And you might want to, you know, take away Joe's computer so you don't have that competition too. Right. <laughs> so Joe's just going to take over my job, so it's awesome. Oh, in that case, never mind. <laughs> We're moving you to the back office, up to the corner there. That's it. That was fun. That was fun. Yeah. Was. So uh, thanks uh, all for participating. So basically what we wanted to go through this session is that uh, the world of prioritization is kind of... Uh, it's, it's a growing uh, uh, landscape and a lot of uh, new capabilities are being introduced, uh, getting past the eight, nine, 10 kind of scoring, uh, you know, and let's go and do, do some action. And, and Roy, uh, also, want... I think what we learned is don't let me prioritize your vulnerabilities <laughs> in your organization. <laughs> <laughs> Email <Yeah>. Joe. <laughs> that, you can let it. Topia. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> or yeah, or yeah. To, you know, buy Topia from Vicarious. Uh, I think is is what we learned. Yeah. yeah. So uh, you're welcome to uh, give it a spin again, as we uh, said also in the former session, where uh, you can just uh, spin up a tenant and deploy the system and see how we can prioritize the vulnerabilities uh, at your local office. Um, and yeah, we'll be uh, happy to showcase that. You're welcome to sign up for the free trial. And hope you enjoyed uh, today's session. Thank you so much, Roy and Shani. That was a lot of fun. Uh, we learned stuff and we had fun. And that's Good the spirit of the show. Again. Yeah, nice seeing you. Looking forward to the next segment. Uh, folks that want to learn more uh, and get a demo can visit securityweekly.com forward slash vicarious. Stay tuned. Paul Batista from Polarity coming up next.